Hi, I'm Dan Barker. I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor. Kimberly Veal is the host of the Black Freethinkers podcast. She's also president of People of Color Without Faith. Kimberly lives in Chicago. She's worked in electrical engineering and she's pursuing a PhD in cultural anthropology. So, Kimberly, welcome to Free Thought Matters. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. So, have you always been an atheist? Well, <laughs> I was raised in a religious household. Uh, my mom was a minister. My grandfather was a minister. Your mother was a minister. Yes, ma'am. Wow. And, you know, throughout the family, I have cousins, aunts, uncles that have, you know, gone into religion, if you will. But I actually stopped believing when I was about 11 or 12 because nobody could answer any of my questions. And so, <laughs> and so you know, we just went along. Uh, my mom went to a variety of different churches and so when you go into these different churches and these different denominations you start hearing contradictory messages and when I was in the seventh grade or I was supposed to be in the seventh grade I was skipped to a freshman and I took a comparative religion course it was over so, right. <laughs> so I stopped believing however I did attempt to return to the church in my early 30s and because I figured that I saw things as a child, you know, I, it has that, that scripture. So I decided to give it another chance as an adult and come to find out that I was much wiser as a child than I had ever <laughs> realized. But that's not, you know, um, that's not a, a, a shot towards religion. What happened was when you get older and you get experience under your belt and live a little bit, you start seeing things a little bit differently. So I did attempt to go back and come to find out I was right, but <laughs> <laughs> but I still do enjoy gospel music. Um, well, so does Dan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the music, you know, I was raised in the faith and there's something about that emotional contact with exactly. the community and all of that, uh, which you can have without religion. You can have that, but. Uh, exactly, well I miss the fellowship. Yeah. And I believe that's one of the things that the secular community could learn, to come together, have support groups, have um, fellowship, come together, you know, um, a soft place to land. Well, and Chicago's not too important. far away. You can come up here and we'll have, oh, yes. we'll have lunch. Okay. And <laughs> <laughs> it was a nice drive. It was only a couple of hours. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, yeah, you know, there are some things I do miss about the church, and there are some things that the secular community can learn from the church. But being that the secular community is really in its infancy, yeah. you know, it's going to take a little time. So and we're very far flung. Exactly. I mean, we've grown quickly, but people are not really as organized yet. Right, but kind we're of, working on that. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to know, Kimberly, mm -hmm. with your mother being um, a preacher, mm -hmm. did you share your doubts with her, and how did she react? Uh, her reaction was, go to your room, read the Bible, and let the Holy Spirit guide you. <laughs> <laughs> so that was basically the response. But she would try to answer some of the questions and then she would send me to the pastor and then he would get frustrated and tell me to go home and pray about it as well but as time went on she understood my rationale for a number of things and what's interesting was when i finally accepted because i feel that you go through these stages of grief when you're finally starting to accept the fact that you know you're a non-believer or a free thinker or an atheist and unfortunately some of us get stuck at angry and it turns into a permanent <laughs> loop right and so i had to learn to get beyond that but I think my mom is proud of the fact that I still do em embrace the church. I still embrace the community because there, there is a lot of good that comes out of the church. Um, I've seen the church utilize federal programs to help people pay their gas and electric bill. I've seen the church design a program with the Chicago Food Depository and give food out in the communities. These are things that we can do as well. But also if we participate in some of these federal programs to get these federal monies, it creates opportunities for you to employ people in the neighborhood. So it's giving them an opportunity to learn some new things, be gainfully employed. And once you start employing the people in the area that you're serving, it becomes 
Christians, you know, their mission to protect you and to, you know, help you in your outreach. So, you know, that's the name of the game. It's just So you'd like to see atheist secular groups go for that public funding to provide those, you know, religion Services. gets the credit and the taxpayers kind of get the bill. Exactly. So exactly. why shouldn't right. the secular groups be going for that kind of funding? And we aren't at this point. Exactly. And that's one of the critiques that I have because I know we have the potential. I know that we can do it. I know that there are those of us who still participate in this. But what's interesting is there are a lot of um, humanists and atheists of color that remain in the church. They still attend church services because that's the only way that they're able really to reach out into the community and to serve the community. Do they know you're an atheist when you're at the church? Um, actually, yes. Wow. I okay. had an interview with um, WGN in Chicago, and it was a pastor that they interviewed as well. And, you know, I've done some work mm -hmm. and I want to do more outreach. And there's a UU church um, that's at the corner of my block. They have a community garden. So every year I sponsor plots, and it's free, it's open, it has signs take what you need, take what you want, they grow. Um, greens, they grow tomatoes, just mm. a number of different things, and they tell the community, take what you need. Well, y your face was on a billboard, <laughs> so you can hardly hide. What did, what, did, do you remember, what did your billboard say? Do you remember? Uh, good without God, something like that. Right, 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 right. Uh -huh. <laughs> so what kind of years. reaction, did you get reaction? Oh, yes, some very interesting reactions. I had some people that I hadn't spoken to in a while. All of a sudden, they're calling me and texting me. They're like, oh, we saw your billboard. You know, huh. and there was a couple of billboards yes. out. And they were like, oh, that's Kim. And what was so interesting huh. is someone sent the word to my uncle. He wasn't very happy, but he got over it. But um, yeah, I've had people recognize me from the billboards. I've, it, it sparked conversation, and I believe that's what we're trying to do is to get that dialogue, get that communication out there, and for people to understand just because you may not believe in a higher power or God, that doesn't mean that you're out here eating babies. It doesn't yeah. mean that you're out here trying to hurt people. It doesn't mean that you have no purpose in life. It's just that while I may not believe in this God or that God, because again, you had to tell me which God it is that you mm -hmm. believe in, that doesn't take away the fact that I do believe that I bear a responsibility to give back to, you know, to mankind and, and to make sure that the people especially the ones that live around me, to make sure that they're taken care of. Do you wear that shirt to church? Yeah. Unbought and unbossed? Yes, yeah, Shirley Chisholm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Did you Love ever it. get to meet Shirley? No, I wish I, I had. Oh, I got really? to go when I was a teenager when she was Excellent. running for president, yes. and my mother and I went to a fundraiser and got to meet her and had soul food. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, you know, she's a great hero. Excellent. Yes, First Shirley Chisholm, Barbara Jordan. Right. Barbara Jordan, another yes, great. Yes, yes, yes. You know, Daisy Bates, you know, mm -hmm. Ella Barker, all of the, Ella Baker, all of those people. Some wonderful pioneers that have come before us, but not only in the political realm, but also in free thought and atheism. Um, you have people like Nella Larson and Lucy, um, Lucy Parsons. Lucy Parsons was Chicago based. Exactly, exactly. What did they call her? The most dangerous woman in America. We have a portrait of her downstairs in Free Thought Hall. Excellent. Here. So oh. also from Chicago, Asa Philip Randolph. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Pullman. Yes. Pullman mm. Porters. A great free thinker. Exactly. A humanitarian. That's right. So I thought all African Americans were just all churchgoers. That's not true, huh? No, that's not. <laughs> <laughs> that's not a necessarily true. Right, 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 right. Uh -huh. But that's okay because see, that's, that's the mindset. You know, a lot of people make that generalization and so when they come across someone that's a free thinker or an atheist or a humanist, first you have to explain who you are. And then what's interesting about many African-American communities, usually the question is, what church do you attend? What denomination mm -hmm. are you? Because they automatically assume. assume that you're a Christian. And if you say you're not a Christian, oh, you're a Muslim? No, I'm not one mm -hmm. of those either. What was interesting, one of the best interactions that I've ever had with you know, um, a stranger was I was walking through the grocery store and she wanted to talk about the milk prices. Mm -hmm. So I'm sitting there and I'm talking to her and she's asking me what church I attended. And I said, none. 
And she was like, oh, are you a Jehovah's Witness? No, I'm not one of those. Okay, are you a Muslim? No. And she was like, well, what are you? And I said, I'm an atheist. And she said, well, you know what? That's okay, too. And she well, gave yes. me a big old hug. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so, you know, the reception, people are becoming more tolerant. But I think one of the reasons why they're becoming more tolerant is because we're communicating yes. more. Yes, we're coming and, out of the closet. And right. they are actually meeting people, they, people that they know. They're realizing and right. know and like are atheists or agnostics are not religious. Exactly. We're not so closeted. And I think that... Mm -hmm. You and we, these are the best advertisements. Exactly. Individuals coming out of the closet as atheists or Ex agnostics. Exactly. And see, I was speaking with um, Dr. Chris Cameron, who's, you know, a black atheist. I just ferret these people out. I just find them. Right? <laughs> and he's currently writing a book about black free thinkers. And so oh. we had a really great conversation January of this year. And he was talking about the research that he's doing right now and how there are many, many more black and brown atheists and humanists and free thinkers than we previously thought. It was just a very taboo conversation. You keep your head down, right? Yes. You just don't, uh... Yes. And so, you know, it's interesting because if you go back and you look at some of the, you know, more important movements of the past, whether it was the black um, power movement with the Black Panthers or the Civil Rights Movement. If you go back and you read some of the materials, quite a few of them were free thinkers and atheists. Um, I attended the Black Panther Party 50th anniversary in Oakland, October of last mm -hmm. year, and it was interesting meeting some of these people, and we were all coming out as atheists or agnostics. Um, Frank Chat um, Chapman, he's mm -hmm. a Black Panther Party member from Chicago, and he's the one that I've been working with. Um, we were the ones that held the economic boycott of um, Chicago downtown businesses during Black Friday. So oh, we were mm -hmm. sitting there and we were talking and I said, well, I'm an atheist. He was like, so am I, so are <laughs> many of us. So there are many, many more of us, you know, out here than most people realize. Well, back in history, uh, W.B. Uh -huh. Du Bois, you know, exactly. a lot of these people who were involved in early labor. Exactly. And, uh -huh. Yeah, my hero, um, Hubert Henry Harrison. Yeah. I love that guy, you know, but it's just a number of them. So, you know, I get really excited talking about these different people. I mean, um, Alice Walker. Alice yeah. Walker, yes. yes. A oh, yes. Oh, yes. yes. You know, people that are call still of, here. Of the Bible. Exactly. Exactly. You know, she's just one example of many mm -hmm. of the ones that are still here, and we just have to reach out. We just have to reach out. It's so you are reaching out. You have yes. a podcast. Uh, yes. What's the name of that podcast? Black Free Thinkers. And with the people of color beyond faith, we were doing some webcasts and getting panels on there. And I stopped it for a while, but I'm going to revive it because mm -hmm. these are very important conversations that we need to have. Um, we did a panel called Black People Do Do Atheism. And it was great. We had like seven people and everybody is talking over each other, but it was a good time. So when I talk about these different things and when we have our gatherings and our conferences, I always bill it as a family reunion hmm. because hmm. it's like you're finding your tribe, you're finding people who are of like mind and we may only get a chance to see each other in person once or twice a year. So let's just have some fun and enjoy the moment. What is the People of Color Beyond Faith? Is that a local group or a national? What is that group? Uh, people of Color Beyond Faith is a group that um, a few of us found it together and basically what we're doing is trying to bring people together and talk about you know a variety of different issues so when we say beyond faith you know I'm one of the proponents that atheism in and of itself is not enough so going beyond faith, going uh, beyond well, atheism. Well, atheism is just the lack of a religion. Exactly. And then what do you, where do you go? It's like right. getting, erasing the debt. Exactly. You don't have the debt, but then how are you going to build something? Right. You know, I am an atheist. However, what defines me is the fact that I'm a humanist and that I'm a free thinker. So we have to look beyond these labels, and that's important. And so, you know, if, um, people of color beyond faith, you know, we do want to stand in solidarity 
with some some religious communities and some churches because we'll get a lot more done working together. So it's about getting beyond certain biases that we may have and finding a way to work together for the greater good of mankind. In the real world, not some supernatural world, but exactly. right here on Earth. Right now. To make well, that's what Butterfly McQueen said, remember? she? I oh, love her. She was the actress who played Prissy in Gone with the Wind. Right. And it was, I got to interview her once. It was a oh, great really? thrill. And you got to accompany her. I did. I got to play the piano for her when she right. sang um, It's Only mm -hmm. a Paper Moon, which was written by uh, an atheist, uh, Yip Harburg. So that was a nice... Excellent. Uh, nice and she said... And she uh, was very feisty. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> it's totally unique. <laughs> she said something like, uh, people talk about the streets of heaven, but there's trash on the streets down here. Let's, cl let's clean up this world. That's right. First. That's you know, right. That's what's important. Yeah. And she said, as my ancestors are free from slavery, I am free from the slavery of religion. Excellent. And I think mm -hmm. she left an endowment. Well, she named the Freedom from Religion Foundation on her checking account. Um, and I think that there was some other, she might have had a savings account. There might have been some uh, local groups in, in Atlanta. Um, and by the time, and of course, you know, she died in a fire. Right. And by the time they paid all the expenses, there was nothing left. But at least she named but us. It, we got so much publicity from that. It exactly. didn't matter. It was priceless that she put her faith in the Freedom From Religion Foundation. She was a lifetime member. Excellent, and see, that's what I do love about the work that you all are doing. You know, the work out here with the separation of church and state is very important. And also, I know that you all work with some religious groups as well, so I commend you on that because that's needed. But most importantly, you all haven't thrown a baby out with the bath water. <laughs> and so you establish these relationships with the religious community. You know, there are things that you all agree on and you work toward together. And that's absolutely wonderful. In many of our lawsuits, there are believers yeah. who join us because they're exactly. not all right-wing evangelicals. Exactly. A lot of believers in the middle or to the left support state church separation. They realize how important it is for us to to all get along and, exactly. and, and for religion, for the government yeah. to be neutral on religion. I think if religion inspires people to do good things, that's absolutely wonderful. Right, I think the, it's just that it doesn't, we want people to know it doesn't take religion right. to do those good things. It's uh, its own reward rather than thinking you're going to be rewarded in heaven for doing something good. Don't we want our consequences here on earth? Exactly. And, well, the objective is different. Yes. We want separation of church and right. state, but for reasons much different than we hmm. want them for. Yes. So it's interesting. But now I understand perfectly what you're saying about what was happening, especially in Arizona, whereas they they basically ran the power company. And if you weren't a member of the Latter-day Saints, they would not allow you to sign up for certain public utilities huh. and services. So that's still in court being litigated. So it's, it's really interesting. But like I said, you know, they want the separation of church and state but for a different reason. Yeah. And yes, and I think it. a lot of the churches are for separation of church and state when it comes yeah. to keeping the state out of their affairs. Especially if it's so, a minority religion, yeah. because right. then they don't want the majority you know, forcing their views on everyone else. If you're small, if you're if you're Jewish or Jehovah's Witnesses. Well, Jehovah's Witnesses, Witnesses are right. very good on separation of oh, church yes. and state. Definitely. Yeah. American Baptists are very good, you know, a minority sect. Right. Yeah. So, um, well, I think separation of church and state is good for all of us. It protects all of us when the exactly. government doesn't take a position on religion. Yeah. But I want to, uh, before we run out of time, okay. I want your opinion and your advice yes, on how the free thought movement as a whole can do better by um, people of color, um, minorities in the United States. I don't like to use that term because right. it's not a minority right. worldwide. What can we do better? What should we be doing? <sighs> <laughs> this is a, probably a long answer. Right, right, right. <laughs> and that's why I think it's extremely important that in this community that we have more safe spaces that we afford people a soft place to land. And I've been seeing more and more of that over the years. You know, um, initially, all I saw was the socializing aspect of atheism. So having a barbecue, having a potluck, bar hopping, all of that is fine, and that's wonderful, and that's needed. But I was looking for people who were more service-oriented, and then I ran across this guy named Joe Zemecki. 
and he was doing outreach to the homeless. And I just thought that was absolutely wonderful. And so when I saw him, you know, I sent him a note and he told me about these other groups, these other people. And I was like, okay, well, you know, maybe there is a spot for me on this team. There are issues that need to be addressed. So when you have prominent luminaries um, espousing the merits of the bell curve and being best buddies with Charles Murray, while also demeaning Black Lives Matter and, and fundamentally um, making negative comments towards identity politics. See, these are some of the reasons why you all have a hard time attracting people of color, namely black people, because when we see and hear these different things, it usually causes us to run the other way. And what's so interesting is that a lot of people know that I'm part of this community. And so, you know, one thing that a lot of people don't realize, there are a lot of people that are part of the Black Lives Matter and community and grassroots who are atheists. humanists and mm -hmm. atheists and all of these things. Mm -hmm. But once we start hearing, oh, wait a minute, they believe in a bell curve and the Islamophobia yeah. and all of these things, we need to police our own community. But you won't hear that in there. our group. We don't talk about those things, the bell curve things. We, uh, oh, but, yeah. But when you say we should reach out to them, isn't there already a dynamic that w here's we and we're right. are those people out there? Because those aren't those people. Those are you. We're all the same. Right. You know, it's, um, there is an openness. And do you think maybe it's partly socioeconomic that as a group there tends to be more ability among the privileged people to join discretionary groups and those as a group are less able to do that are less able to participate in groups like ours well okay some of it is a money issue so when you throw a conference and it's two three six seven eight hundred dollars the average person you know yeah. in, in marginalized communities they can't afford it so we have to address that but in addition to that in many of our communities, we face a set of issues that are so different. So when we're trying to figure out how we're gonna keep a roof over our head, how we're gonna feed our kids, how we're gonna pay our rent, do I have enough money to get a bus card to get to work all week? I don't have enough money for my lunch, but I, I still have to make sure the kids get their reduced lunch because I make one dollar over the limit mm -hmm. that's there in order for me. So I mean, the, the dynamics in many regards Guards are much different. Survival. I mean, you, exactly. you survival, or it's feeling that there's a lack of concern right. or compassion, or exactly. So, uh, we can debate ph philosophy all you like, but right. but we have real issues right now. Exactly. To to. Yeah, science. I can sit here and talk to you about science all day long if I wanted to, but it makes no difference if I can't feed my babies. Mm -hmm. You know. Right. So you know the objectives, and so you know there are certain privileges that are not extended to many minority communities. So that's why we become, you know, um, more dependent on each other and utilizing these services. And well, you know, we, we have, uh, we've had student essay contests for many decades, and we've noticed that minority students tend to enter and win a lot of our student essay contests because they're smart. So we started a new one for okay. students of color and Mm -hmm. The response has been tremendous. A lot of interest and some amazing Excellent. talent and thinkers in there, which we would like to showcase Excellent. to try to fight that stereotype. Exactly, you know? exactly. And again, it's about finding a com you know a community, a support base. You know, people that understand, people that will encourage and support us as we go through this thing called life, that metamorphosis. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's really interesting, but I mean, there are a lot of things that we could talk about regarding bringing these different communities together and finding out what's needed. But, you know, conversations need to be held. And one of the issues that I've experienced is I would see these panels talking about diversity and it would be all white men, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and then I'll see maybe one white woman. And then a couple of years later, it was one person of color, mm -hmm. but yet we still haven't addressed the fundamental issues, you know? So before we can get out here and espouse the greatness of Charles Darwin, or, you know, quote, you know, Richard Dawkins or Christopher Hitchens, 
you know, we need to make sure that people basic needs are being met, so food, clothing, and shelter. That's well, we important. do quote Anthony Penn and yes. Norm Allen as much as That's we right. can. I mean, there's exactly you know, it's not it's not trying to be equal opportunity. There's just some great minds out there. That's exactly, and see, that's one of the things that you know I feel responsible for. So that's why I promote the works of Norman Allen and Tony yeah. Penn, and you know, even Jeffrey Perry, Even though he's a white guy, he's written extensively about Hubert Henry Harrison. So I've had him on the show a couple yeah. of times, and we've talked about the so. So that's why we're trying to teach people the history, who these people are, why they are important, and then also establish some self-esteem in some of the younger people. They did it, and you can do it too. And, and so it doesn't take a lot of money. Just read a few books and let's have a few conversations. Let's yeah. talk about these things. What do you think is going to be the future of um, the free thought movement and African Americans? Are there going to be are there national groups that are going to need, be needed to be formed? Are there primary groups right now? I mean, if, if there's somebody listening right now who wants to meet up with other African-American atheists and agnostics, where do they go? All right. Many of us found each other on Facebook, mm -hmm. especially around 2010, 2011, when he opened it up to the general public. And so you can find these groups on Facebook, Twitter, Meetup, and a number of other different social media venues that are out there. And what's interesting as far as the future of people of color in this community, well, again, we have to start self-policing this community, however, it's growing. More and more people of color are coming out as atheists and humanists and identifying as such. But one of the things that we have to also understand is that atheism is just, you know, another component of the whole person. So, you know, again, if we see each other once or twice a year and we're happy to see each other and enjoy each other's company and maybe interact on social media, that's fine. But I, I think there's a bright future there's a bright future ahead for people of color becoming more and more involved in the secular community. Um, again, there's that intersectionality and finding out where we intersect and where we meet and what we can agree on and work towards. And I think it's so cool that so many of the founders and activists of Black Lives Matters are not religious. Right, It really exactly. is a different, a changed world, I think, and, yes. and that they're being accepted. Exactly. For the most part, I mean. <laughs> well, today. we're out of time here, oh, okay. Kimberly. We, uh, we could talk for hours and hours about right. all of this, but thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you for, for your activism. And, and your bravery and uh, all that you are doing. It's I appreciate great. it. Thank you for having me.